For more on what to expect, Emily Jashinsky joins us now. She's a DC correspondent for Unheard and the co-host of Counterpoints, found wherever podcasts are sold. Emily, good to talk to you today. Hey, Vince, how's it going? It's going great. And uh, Joe Biden is uh, off to Camp David today. He's going to be there for the next week. Does it really take a week to prepare for a 90-minute debate with two commercial breaks? I have never heard of this. I mean, seriously, uh, the sitting president of the United States actually decamping, literally decamping mm -hmm. to like a debate prep seminar for an entire week. I mean, I know that they start preparing a lot and they prepare for uh, a good number of weeks leading up to the debate. But for him to actually not be in the White House for the next week, I find extremely weird. I don't know about you. That just strikes me as very strange. It's pathetic is what it is, because it obviously suggests that he needs immense help to prepare for such a small event, 90 minutes on TV. You can handle that. Uh, you should obviously, you know, do some prep work for it, but uh, an entire week of it, it's a little over the top. What do you do? You have any expectations for what's going to take place at this debate? What are they advising Biden to do? What are they hoping he actually pulls off? So I basically like as a journalist, never am like interested in going to these presidential debates because what you see on TV is basically what you see in person. But this one, I think the big story is actually going to be the debate itself because it's breaking this historical pattern of using the Commission on Presidential Debates and doing it in the fall. And they have, uh, because they're sort of unchained by the Presidential Debate Commission traditions and rules, uh, they have these new rules that the candidates have agreed to, at least for now, where uh, Trump is going to be muted, or I guess both their mics are going to be muted when they're not talking. So that's supposed to minimize crosstalk. Um, they are, again, doing this in June as opposed to September, October. Um, it's, it's really wild. And whether they actually are able to pull this off, I think it's genuinely a big question because, again, they're not bound to any of the Presidential Debate Commission commitments. And there are all kinds of different things that are going to be new. So if CNN can pull this off without any candidate backing down and saying, you know, you're trying to pull a fast one, um, the muting is going to be a really big deal. Uh, who knows if that actually works? It yeah. seems to me pretty odd. What are they going to decide? When are they going to decide when crosstalk is appropriate and when it's not? I mean, you have any good debate is going to have some crosstalk. So I don't know how they think they're going to pull that one off. Yeah. Well, let me. I mean, let's talk about the logistics of that for a moment because. As I understand it, they're going to be in a television studio, right? They're in Atlanta at a CNN studio. Right. They right. will be standing at lecterns, and they the candidate whose time is uh, not going at the moment will have their mic muted. But here's the thing about a television studio. Those men will be able to hear each other. They're they're at room volume standing next to each other. So if if Biden is speaking, for instance, and Trump is interjecting, Biden is going to hear him at full volume, standing next to him doing that very thing. The TV audience will not. We'll have a very different experience. We may hear Trump muffled through Biden's microphone. But it, it's going to be weird because Biden is going to feel compelled to respond with Trump speaking and will not have the same kind of audio experience that the rest of us are having. Am I right? No, I'm actually so fascinated by that. That's that's really a, a great point because they're not going to know what the audience is hearing and what the audience is hearing is what the big deal is going to be. And so, again, I think when you, whenever you get away from the tradition, I'm perfectly happy for them to do that. I think that's fine. By the way, this is going to be nominated. This is going to be um, moderated by Jake Tapper and Dana Bash, who are some of the most anti-Trump voices in media. So that Trump agreed to this debate with, the most anti-Trump network in news and uh, the most, well, I guess it's up there with MSNBC, but yeah. the most like anti-Trump uh, anchors who are really more like pundits at that network is interesting in and of itself. Well, he called their bluff, um, didn't he? Was, absolutely. Absolutely. And there were a lot of conservatives, you know, this ones who said, don't agree to do a debate with CNN. Uh, don't give them what they want, which is ads and eyeballs and all of that. Now, if anyone can do it um, to their advantage, I'm yeah. sure it's Donald Trump. But still, I mean, that you have those two moderating it. I don't know how this is. I think, honestly, Vince, my prediction is that it's going to be a logistical mess. And the logistical mess is also going to be a substantive mess because uh, it's going to bleed into the actual content of the debate. It might even start to percolate yeah. in the 24 hours before the debate as candidates go back and forth about what's allowed and what's not. Sure. Uh, and I want to talk more about the logistics of that in a moment, but focusing for a moment on Dana Bash and Jake Tapper, 
you know, if as we've watched the campaign barrel along, one of the things that's become more and more obvious to more and more Americans is that there truly is a concerted effort to do something unfair to hurt Donald Trump's candidacy. The the courtroom um, uh, campaign that's been going on, the courtroom interference that's been going on, has only brought tr more people to Trump's side who've looked at this and gone, wait a second, this is crazy. He's being prosecuted for all of these things in the election year? Uh, that's wild. And so there is a chance, I think, next week that people are going to view this debate as nothing more than a dog pile. They're going to look and they're going to say, okay, Biden, Dana Bash, Jake Tapper, all out to attack that guy. Why are they doing that? And it may actually help Trump in the end. Oh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a, an interesting point because the debates between Biden and Trump back in 2020 were also kind of odd. They were new types of debates because it was uh, in the early days. Well, the early days is a relative term, but of COVID, because we had to go through another, what, two years of it if you're in a blue city like Washington, D.C. Uh, but it was, you know, a different debating experience, similar maybe because they were in a TV studio. There wasn't a live audience. Uh, and it was I think Biden performed better, I'll, I'll say, than I expected. Um, and I guess when you're in such a tight time frame, a couple of hours, it's easier to control, uh, you know, your candidate and, you know, any potential memory issues, health issues. If you have a two-hour window, I, I suppose it's easier to work with uh, if you have somebody as senile as, as Joe Biden mm -hmm. needing to perform. And I think that's where Trump, he, he has to be careful because sometimes those funny Trump moments look really bad juxtaposed with, uh, you know, it almost looks like punching down um, if Joe Biden is so feeble. Uh, but, you know, he, he was he managed to perform in 2020. I have my doubts that he's going to be able to do it again in 2024, yes. uh, given, you know, just well, the decline that we've seen in the last few years. So I have an expectation that the, what they're telling Biden this week is they're trying to feed him a, a number of attack lines to try and throw Donald Trump off. I think that is the game plan, I, I believe, because because Biden is not running on some sort of positive record. He's not he's not up there to talk about how great his presidency has been, although he'll 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 lie about that to some extent. He'll talk about that. A lot of this is going to be accusing Trump of being an insurrectionist, a convicted felon of saying that he thinks immigrants are animals or, you know, any number, any number of the lies that we've heard uh, coming out of the White House. This is the line of attack I think they're going to want Joe Biden to be taking because they're, they want to try and get a rise out of Donald Trump uh, and to make it seem like he, he's just out of control. He, and, and I really think that that's the strategy going into next week. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I totally think that's right. And I think we've seen it intentionally used as bait for the last you know, five, four years now since it was in 2020. Um, but even since then, just in the Biden administration, we saw him give that speech in Philadelphia. We know that they're running on democracy, democracy, democracy. Uh, it is their message. It's a great way to bait Trump <laughs> into uh, perhaps looking like he's punching down at Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. um, but it's for that that group of suburban voters. And that's what they feel is the key to the election. They don't mind losing some of those Obama Trump voters again. Yeah. They think if they can, you know, run up turnout in the cities, which is going to be really tough for them, um, but also get suburban, keep those suburban voters, uh, then, hey, you know, we'll just keep hammering home the democracy theme yeah. all day. Although I have to say, I, I've seen uh, President Trump respond to this on the campaign trail, that, that particular line of attack, and uh, he has a real opportunity next week to, to handle it as well by saying, you want to talk about democracy? You're the guy trying to throw your political opponent in jail. Your party has been mm -hmm. trying to remove not just my name, but Robert F. Kennedy's name from the ballot all across the country. Uh, and uh, so you, Joe, are the threat to democracy. We've heard President Trump say it on the campaign trial. He may very well say it next week. I don't know how Biden even handles that. Yeah, I, I would. If Trump is smart, I think that strategically or because the people around him are smart when they're prepping him. And actually, it's, it's worth mentioning, Vince, that Trump is apparently not doing the mock debate nonsense that a lot of candidates do behind closed doors where they have one of their aides play the other candidate. Maybe that makes sense if you're in a big debate. Um, but if it's just one on one and it's two such known quantities, Trump is apparently just getting policy background refreshers. Yeah. And honestly, that means you go in and you're a little bit more freewheeling. You're not obsessing over talking points. I think it's smart. I mean, Democrat or Republican, I think that's a better way to approach the debate. Yes. But hopefully, uh, if if he wants to, you know, if he wants to defeat Biden in this, 
the best way for him to do it, I think, is exactly what you just outlined, is to turn the tables. And he's been better at that than any Republican, at least in my memory. 100 percent. So here's another piece of this debate news we just get today. Um, you know, some of the some of the items of the debate had hadn't yet been chosen. They were being picked today in the form of a coin toss. Uh, Biden's team, Biden himself, they won the coin toss today. And so CNN said, you have one of two options. Either you can pick your podium position or you can pick the order of the closing statements. Now, for any anybody on in America, anybody on the whole planet, if you were given that option, you would choose the order of the closing statements as your priority. You'd want to go last. You want to be the final impression in that debate. Anybody. Biden's team picked podium position today. They won the coin toss. And they said that Joe Biden is going to be standing on the right sa- side of the stage now as viewers look at the TV screen. That was their preference. And that means President Trump got to pick who goes, who goes last on closing statements, and it's going to be President Trump. President Trump is going to be the final guy on closing statements now in this debate. What the hell were they thinking, Emily Jasinski? Why does Biden need to pick a podium so urgently? Yeah, you know, I'm trying hard not to be conspiratorial here. Uh, but, you know, it does. It just makes you wonder if there's, you know, an angle. Remember when those facelift pictures of Biden came out? Yes. So bad. And you can still get it at certain angles. I mean, I don't know what it is, but for the life of me, I cannot understand. Yeah. I cannot understand why that would be so important. Is well, maybe the of maybe the zipper for his body opinion? double suit is on the other side of his face. Maybe they wanted to block that out or something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to know because it's totally unthinkable that anyone would prioritize their position on the stage like maybe there's a good reason i just can't think of it what it is right now maybe it's the direction that he'd be facing in the audience maybe he wants to look at jill i don't know maybe the 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 exit door is closer to that one so that they can get him out of there quickly maybe the bathroom is nearby i don't even i can't even begin to understand this in fact the new york times uh, as as much as they carry Biden's water, they're kind of bewildered too. They wrote today in their coverage, Mr. Biden's campaign did not immediately provide a comment about why he wanted to choose podium placement over speaking order or why he even prefers that placement. It is, it, this is crazy. I Wasn't it like Ariana Grande a couple years back who she only wanted to appear with one side of her face in, in any media? She's like, this is where the dimple is. This is my better side. That's Maybe Joe Biden thinks he's got a better side. Maybe he's just vain, Emily Jashinsky. That's what I'm wondering right now, but because it's the only explanation I can think of. Um, and I'm actually even surprised that that's an option that because nobody would think to choose it. Like nobody would think to prioritize your location on the stage. It's, it's so weird. It is so stupid. I, I but you know, but there must be some explanation for it. Uh, at, at any rate, Emily Jashinsky, thank you as always. Always love our conversations. Uh, she's the DC correspondent at Unheard, and she's got the great podcast Counterpoints. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> 